Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've no idea how this is going to go. I suddenly thought how foolish it was to say I'd do a question and answer session rather than a talk, because it's so much more risky. But um, I did the walk this morning. Some of you were on that, um, and maybe there are some questions that will come from that. But for those of you that weren't on, on, on the walk, just a word or two of introduction. I've been interested in archaeology since I was that high and um, used to find stone circles and the like because I lived near the Peak District, came out every other weekend, my parents were keen walkers and was always fascinated by stone circles, barrows, standing stones. But archaeology was not one of those subjects that you could do at school. I was also interested in art and I was interested in geology. I ended up, hated school, went to art college at 16, um, trained as a painter and a sculptor, but was always, always kept the interest in archaeology and became very interested in stone circles, the ideas of Professor Tom, stone, astronomy, geometry, but a general interest as well. Um, after teaching in an art college for eight years, and writing strange books about astronomy and geometry at stone circles. Um, I went over to the dark side and I became, became a, a conventional archaeologist, more by look than design, um, in that I'd written a book on stone circles in the peak and I'd got this idea to, to spread my wings and do stuff on stone circles throughout the country. And a friend suggested I wrote to the archaeology department at Sheffield. Um, and I wrote a letter saying, I'm really interested in stone circles. I want to write about them. Is, do you know of any sources of grant, thinking I wanted about 500 quid to pay for some petrol? And um, they said, oh, come down. Came down, went down on the, on the allotted day to find I'd walked without them telling me into a full-blown interview for a PhD. Um, and they said, we think you're completely nut, nutty, but we like your ideas. Um, you do a year of the part of a two-year MA course to prove to that you're academically sound, write a few essays, then we support you for a PhD on the design of stone circles, which is exactly what happened. Completely changed the direction my life was going in. And uh, after looking at the stone circles, happened to get a job, the job I'd always wanted, which is the survey archaeologist for the National Park. And um, that was in 1989, and I've not wanted to have a different job because I've got the job I always wanted, so I'm still there. Um, retire one day, but not yet. <laughs> anyway, in my job, I have to know a little bit about everything because my bread and butter work is to go onto a farm or of an estate, chats with the state or wherever, because people have come to the National Park and they're saying, we're interested in farming in a conservation-minded way, and who, by the way, can I have a grant to make that possible, please? And my job is to go out there and give the property a once-over, and, and an ecologist will do the same thing, and between us we'll say, these are the things we'd like you to look after and, and, and not damage or destroy in return for getting the grant. These days it's through um, countryside stewardship, but we've had our own schemes. It's been going on for years. Um, I started in 1989, as I mentioned, and after a few months we worked out that if I spent five minutes in every field or the, the equivalent area of moorland, actually physically being there, preparing to go, see, finding out what records we'd already got, finding new things, then drawing a plan, writing a few paragraphs on whatever I'd find. It was going to take me 36 years to get around the National Park. Um, we've done about two thirds of it. <laughs> and one of the things we've realized that is that if you get away from roads and public footpaths, only two out of three sites of national importance are currently known about in areas that we've not yet looked at. And something like 95% of the rest of the archaeology has not been recorded yet. In an upland area like the Peak District, Peak District, where there's not been intensive agriculture 
there is a huge amount still out there from all periods. And I foolishly said to Andy when we were talking, this might be people wouldn't, might like the opportunity to, to, to say, well, what questions have you always wanted to ask an archaeologist? Here I am, questions. <laughs> right at the back. Um, with the barrows, and when they've got a burial in them, do you think that's symbolism of them, uh, pregnancy and somebody getting reborn into the earth? I, I think almost certainly. Proving it is a different matter, but, you know, that's the, how it feels, certainly. But as I mentioned when we were walking this morning, when you look at the contents of Bronze Age round barrows, the variation is absolutely astounding in different rites. There's each family group had private ceremonies and had variations on general themes. So you can be buried with your knees completely drawn up. You can be buried just on one side or on the other, or flat on your back. You can be cremated, you can go in a pot, or you can go in, in a kist. Or, or there's so many different variations that if this idea of crouched is a fetal position then it wasn't universally adopted. There were lots of other ways of doing it. One thing that we do know that they did, when you look in the burial mounds, you don't just get skeletons or cremations, you get lots of scattered human bones. And one of the things they were doing is leaving the bones at surface, often with a fence round, um, for them to decay at surface and for the birds to take bits away and foxes or whatever. And then they're interring bones months later. Uh, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things going on in prehistory. When, when it comes to the cairns, um, just because of what I just said then about the bones, um, do you have entrances? Because I probably don't know as much about it as a lot of people that um, I've always been interested, but I've never actually gone and read the books and whatnot, uh, or kept up with the news. The entrances to the do, is there any scientific way you can know when the entrances were covered after a body was, was put in there or whether they were left uncovered or were they covered straight away when the body was interred or is it different for each one? The simple answer is it's di they're different for each one. <laughs> um, it depends. If all you've got are the records of an antiquarian excavation, often you can't tell. If something's very carefully excavated, and there's lots of ifs and buts and maybes, the vast majority of these places have been ransacked by antiquarians or people robbing the site for building stone or whatever. In those circumstances, you know, you, you, you're up against it. But when you find a completely intact deposit, um, you, you, depends what you find, but... Is, is there ever any evidence of animal entry into the cave? Yes. While the body was probably in this decom decomposing, i.e. not years later, but in the immediate time of body being interred? I don't know. What you do get are gnawings by, by rats or whatever and you find it on the bones. But at what stage of decomposition the gnawing of the bones was happening, I'm not sure any everyone's ever worked out. Um, I don't know whether a rat would find a 500-year-old bone attractive or whether they like it a bit fresher. <laughs> Hunter clue. Um, sorry, can I just, just to answer your, the, the crux of your question, if you can find material such as charcoal, such as bone, and you can put it in a very well stratified context to do with the blocking of the tomb, then you can use radiocarbon dating. So there are other techniques as well to do with um, optical luminescence, which we can use as well, which um, can, can date when something last received daylight, which, but 
that's quite a new technique and the trouble is with that one is it's like with radiocarbon dating 50 years ago when it was first invented everybody thought oh this will solve everything and then they started calibrating it against bristletone pines and realized that you've not just got a, a, a curve that looks like that so you can say right this is here so it's got to be that date it wobbles like this so you get lots of plus and minuses of several hundred years sometimes and I think with optical luminescence dating, we think it's simple, but we'll find complications. And eventually, a few years down the line, we'll be able to use it, but in a refined way compared with now. Um, um, the stone circles in Derbyshire, yeah. um, you know, there are um, you know, some circles that are supposed to be aligned with different astronomical um, the ancient moon and the sun, etc. Yeah. What about the circles in Derbyshire? Is there any that are particularly good at, at, at sort of depicting an astronomical alignment, or, or is there a predominance of moons? Or I of think. I believe that people in prehistory were interested in astronomy, but there are problems with getting at that. Professor Tom, who set a lot of this lot going, there were people like Lockyer before then, but Tom was the person that really came up with lots and lots of data. I think got it wrong. Because what he was saying was that um, people in prehistory were into highly sophisticated astronomy, looking for slight wobbles in, in, in lunar cycles and so on, so that you could predict eclipses. But to be able to do that, you had to think like a modern astronomer and use sight lines that were kilometres long so you could see a standing stone barely with the naked eye and get that kind of precision. I think we now think that the astronomy that works is more symbolic. It's more, wow, that's impressive sort of astronomy, you know, with the sun setting here or rising there. Um, I think the problem with Professor Tom's stuff was he actually was misled in that he, he wasn't a, a, a professor of astronomy, he was a professor of engineering. He got this real bee in his bonnet, he devoted his life to it. Really nice chap, I met him a few times. He did all this study based on what he could find on the London survey maps. And if it, all the things that were marked as standing stones and, and, and stone circles and so on, on Ordnance Survey maps of the 30s and 40s, he went and looked at. Now, the problem was a lot of the things marked as such on those Ordnance Survey maps were marked wrongly. And if you take out all the things that turned out not to be even prehistoric, or to be interpreted in certain different, in, in totally different ways. All his histograms showing the significance of certain points around the horizon don't actually work anymore. The evidence disappears. <laughs> um, so the, the real astronomy is what people like Clive Ruggles and Aubrey Burl have worked on. And when you've got architecture that's very distinctive, like the recumbent stone circles of Aberdeenshire or some of the stone rows, where you can say there's a definite orientation marked and you get repeated patterns, then it's very clear you've got an interest by prehistoric peoples in astronomy. But when you get to something like the Peak District, the problem is you stand in the middle of a stone circle and you've got a ring of stones. So you've suddenly got, you know, 10, 15, 20 directions indicated. If you then compare that with all the different places the sun and the moon can rise and set throughout the year because it changes from season to season. And if you look, say, at first magnitude stars, as Professor Tom did, the real thing, situation is what would be surprising is if that stone didn't align with something. There's so many things and places it can align to. The, the problem from a statistical point of view is giving it significance because it's bound to align with something. Um, 
And the problem with the stone circle, you know, the small one, like where we went this morning, which, you know, if I'm stood in its centre, its edges by the wall there, I can, I can look through that chair there and I can get an alignment if that was a stone. If I stand there, I've got a different alignment. And the lack of precision makes it really difficult. Now, what do you take as your targets? With the stone circles up on these eastern moors of the Peak District, quite a lot of them have got one stone that's about this high, twice as high as all the rest. So you think, ah, great. And you look at them and they're all pointing in different directions and half of them point too far north to be anything to do with the sun or the moon and you can't get patterns out of it. There's one site which I can't begin to prove which I just think is so beautiful that I'd love to believe it was real. If you go to Nine Stone Close on Hart Hill Moor, there's a wonderful setting, a, a natural crag called Robin Hood Stride. It's a big crag comes up, sticks about the ground with two big stone pillars, all entirely natural. What happens at midsummer, or to be more precise, the nearest full moon to midsummer, is you sit in the middle of the stone circle and the moon comes along and disappears behind one pillar, keeps coming, and for a few minutes he's sitting there as if it's on an altar. You know, you're looking up at this wonderful thing, you know, with two big pillars of stone with the moon between, and then eventually it keeps going. I can't begin to prove that the people who built the stone circle put the stone circle in the right place so that has happened, but would happen, but I'd like to think it's true. John, can I follow that one up because... 30 years ago, you got me interested in archaeological astronomy. <laughs> oh dear. You, when you came to you and talked to Manchester Astronomical Society. The one where this astronomer royal had to be sent home because he'd come on the wrong day. Uh, probably, <laughs> I'm not sure. But uh, I agree with 100% with what you just said. But uh, having said that, a year ago I gave a talk about the possible archaeological, uh, archaeoastronomy alignments of solstitial sunsets and sunrises in the leak area. Oh yeah. Followed on from the research I did on the double sunset. Ah, so that was you. I put a, a name to a face now. <laughs> that is a historically documented. Thing. Yeah. But I agree hundred percent with what you say that a lot was overinterpreted by Alexander Tom. But weren't you guilty of the same thing in your book? Oh absolutely. <laughs> yeah yeah. I mean I've often wondered why you why you never actually expanded on your book when you gave us a talk thirty years ago. Right. <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> I wrote a book in, published in 1978, Stone Circles of the Peak, which had all this astronomy and all this geometry. And then, two years later, it's the time I told you about when I went to start my PhD. I was asked to do a PhD well, I wanted to do a PhD, I should say, on the design of stone circles. And I looked at the geometry, and, and that went hand in hand with, a, with a, the megalithic yard, units of measurement, and I looked at the astronomy. In the end, I very much concentrated on the geometry, and I'll talk about that in a minute. On the astronomical side, I did quite a lot of work. It was this work I've just been mentioning about looking at all the Tom alignments and seeing which were the real archaeological sites. And I, I wrote a hugely long paper, which is still on a shelf somewhere, gathering dust. Um, I submitted it to um, Clive Ruggles for the um, Archaeoastronomy Journal. And Clive said he didn't want to publish it because he felt that we'd been, done too much Tom bashing and let's move on and, 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 and look for positive things to do with archaeoastronomy and that's why it didn't get followed up. It was too negative, I'm not at all sorry it never got published. I was much more interested in the geometry and I was a firm believer in it and I published this book with all these wonderful, you know, ellipses and flattened shapes and all the rest of it to all the Peak District stone circles. And I firm believed it. But nagging doubts started coming in. One was that if you've got all these wonderfully nice shapes, 
why aren't the stones beautifully arranged against the geometry? Why do they sort of fall at fairly ran random points around the rings? One day I had a brainwave. I thought to myself, one of the problems with all this geometry is that we're thinking as 20th century, it was then 20th century, 20th century people. We're looking at it with a scientific way of looking. Is that the right way to look at it? Is, if I could imagine a situation where people in a different culture would think very differently. Not more, not more primitively, more simply, but just differently. Where if what they were interested in was wanting something to look good, I want to build a circle that looks brilliant, that looks circular, that, that fulfills all my requirements, how would I go about doing it? If I wasn't a 20th century person and, and didn't want to get a peg and get a piece of rope and walk around with it taut and get a nice circle or do all the other geometrical things, but I just wanted it to look good, what would happen? Because if you stood in the middle of a ring looking outwards, you can't judge whether it's circular because you, you, you can't see it all at once. If you stand outside it, then it's the, the railway lines becoming narrower as you look into the distance problem. That when something looks circular, actually it isn't. And unless you've got a hot air balloon or whatever in the Bronze Age, you can't assess the circularity. So what I did, uh, I did it with a, with a friend of mine, a chap called Pete Herring, uh, who's been working as an archaeologist in Cornwall for God knows how long now. Um, we did an experiment. We got a load of students from Sheffield University, and we, rather than come out on the moors, we went to a nice flat park in the middle of Sheffield. And we said, here, I have 10 buckets. Here, I have 20 buckets. Here, I have 30 buckets. And we put two of them on the ground, some at 10 metres apart, some at 20, some at 30. So we replicated the number of stones and the diameters of stone circles as a whole throughout Britain. And we did it over 100 times. And that, that we set them a rule, a simple rule. Spend as long as you like, put these buckets, or some of them we gave buckets, some we gave ranging poles, just in case it made a difference, it didn't. Um, and we want you to lay them out in a ring. We want you to take as short or as long amount of time as you're happy with. The one thing you mustn't do is measure anything. Just do it by eye. And they all laid out. We did it over. We did over a hundred of these. We call them stone circles. We call them bucket circles. And some people, you know, they just reflect. It's just human nature. Some people were very cavalier, five minutes, oh, that'll do, and they were off to the pub. Some people spent half an hour, an hour, and were really careful, and were looking at it from every angle under the sun till they were happy. Then, this is the crucial bit, what we did is we surveyed accurately every one that they did. And then what I did was fit Professor Tom geometries more successfully to those than the real set of stone circles. And then I knew what a problem. <laughs> it didn't work. Most of the stone circles, I am now convinced, were laid out by eye, by people that just didn't think like scientists or architects, but people who thought they wanted something to look good, and it's as simple as that. There are exceptions, and interestingly, there are significant exceptions. Stonehenge. Um... Ring of Brodka. Oh, Stanton Drew, the big circle at Stanton Drew. They are more circular than you could create by eye. And they're the ones where I think, if you look at what's happening throughout the, the, that period of British prehistory, you start seeing specialists. You start seeing specialist people making things out of gold. You start seeing metalsmiths a bit later on. Um, 
And I think what you're seeing at the very best sites are people coming along to tribal leaders and saying, hey, you know these common garden stone circles? I can do you one that's a bit better. The, 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 and what you're seeing are the first architects. That's the conclusion I came to. That actually the, the sophisticated geometries, plain and simply, don't work. Go on. Um, I grew up on the that the ring of rod goes in one degree of a perfect circle, I think. Mm. Um, but if you can't tell by eye anyway, was it just the prestige of having a, an almost perfect circle then? Because if you couldn't see by eye that the architect was actually doing it properly, as a proper circle, what would have been the attraction? Or would it be that he was possibly going down the geometry route himself and therefore oh, it I, like it was a high technical... I, I think that the... the, the proto-architects, if you want to call them, that were you know, using, using rope and, and laying it out accurately. I suspect in the way that people might have been thinking then, that gives the site more magical significance because it's beyond what people can recognise just from looking at it. Has anybody ever, if you take the in a stone circle, not necessarily the heel stone, which because it's sometimes bigger than the circle stone. Has anyone ever done an average height for each stone circle and then seen if there was any kind of difference throughout the country going north to south or to west or anything like that? that the average height for each circle? It's... I'm just starting to scroll it. It's... I... It, it, it's one of the things I did for my PhD. Mm. Not to see... If they get bigger from one part of the country to another because it's not that simple. Because you get very tall standing stones in, in Orkney, in, in Wessex, in various other places. That is a lot to do with just the materials that are available. And in places where you don't get stone, we now know as archaeologists, you get lots of timber circles. And some of them with postals or posts like this, you know, they must have been huge. Um, no, but what I was looking at is vari regional variations in types of design. So in other words, you get some types of stone circle in some areas where they're very carefully spaced between stones, where they get what you call graded, where they're low at one side and they've got to get higher to the other side. Um, and you get other stone circles of diff different regions, different dates, where the spacing's awful, the, 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 they're like this all the way around. It just wasn't a carefully considered part of the design. The peop that doesn't mean that they're inferior stone circles. It means it didn't feature in, in the design for the people that built them. Oh, no, you, that, that, that's irrelevant because it's all to do with put it here rather than just there. It doesn't take any more time. Hi. Um, uh, back to the alignment, I'm afraid. Yeah, go on. I've always thought that uh, stone circles started to be built around the time of uh, early agriculture. Yeah. And people were going from uh, hunter gatherer to farming communities. So don't you think, and I'm thinking about lines and stuff, I agree with you standing in the middle of a stone circle, you can't tell what, but standing at an outline, looking through possibly two stones within the circle, you could be quite accurate alignments of the time when you want to plant your corn or whatever you need to do in an agricultural way when you used to want to plant your sort of existence prior to that. I think, I'll talk around it for a minute, I think from the begin, beginning of agriculture they didn't build a stone circle for at least 500 years and it might have been a thousand years from the earliest Neolithic. But I think if what you want is something that helps you know when to plant your crops, there are much easier ways of doing it. You don't need a stone circle to do it. A stone circle might be about that sort of thing in, in the context of ritual and ceremony. But if you want to just literally know about calendars, all you need is a stick in the ground and look at shadows and, 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 and counting days. If, 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 if somebody or a free, not the Druids, but who might have later become the Druids, mm. or a group of architects or whatever from different tribes have 
someone realises that they've figured out that the sun always sets there on the shortest day, rises there on the shortest day, air on the longest day, up there on the longest day, etc. Look, this is happening repetitive. That would be a, a much bigger thing to them than it is to, to, to us today. Would they not have wanted to record that in a way that was more permanent, such as it would be passed to all their children, their descendants, rather than wood, which might rot? Uh, that, that's the way I see it, is that they wanted to commemorate something eternally, if you like. Yes. The, the, now, the whole, the children, the, the tribe, what they were about, their families, and so on and so on, would be able to use practically forever. I think you're making a, a very important point. I think it's very important that people want to make permanent records. Some societies do, some don't give a bugger. But you know, um, this idea of permanent record is important. But for us, in the more extreme form, you see it with rock art, where you've got cup and ring, and it's so abstract. That must have meant something that people did it, but it's very di difficult for us to now get at what those meanings are. The same is with the stone circles, because the more you look at the stone circles, Unfortunately, it, it isn't just a simple repeated pattern all over the place. And it might be, and, and, and it's like with Robin Hood's stride, or the, the description of, of the moon going behind the pillars. The ring, it's the placing of the ring and what the horizon does that often can be important because it's often the sun rising at mid, midsummer out of the sacred hill or that sort of a thing is what you would commemorate forever. So the circle is just the place, the stones just define the place rather than each stone be the alignment, if you see what I mean. Could it, could it also uh, be the fact that there's a difference because in lowland areas where there is agriculture, uh, stones are placed in to signify agricultural times, like the stones have sowing, Reaping, start spring, start summer, etc. But in island areas, you're looking more at the sort of things that shepherds would do at that time of year rather than arable farmers. Would that make a difference to why they're all a little bit different? Or it it could do, although. <coughs> Again, if only life was that simple. Because we now know, even in the uplands, that, that it's a, a, in prehistory, it's more often than not, it's a mixed economy with, with livestock and cereal cultivation. And it's the same in the lowlands. There's not, the one thing that, that really buggers things up is we don't know where the trees were. <laughs> and, and it's like with a lot of these monuments. We see them now out in the moor and we see all these wonderful alignments. And, and actually, if it had been in a wood, you wouldn't have seen any of it. That is really hard to, and it, if you've ever been to a been to a, a chamber tomb or a stone circle that's now in the middle of a forest, it doesn't half change how you feel about the place. Yeah, John, that, that's the point that I was making last year. With the alignments in the uh, western Bee district on the uh, in the Staffordshire Moorlands and the Cheshire Hills. They are these long lines, they are the, the long sight lines, the, mm. the not the ones that you might have seen from a stone circle. These are sight lines of five miles, and that's at the solstice. Yes. Uh, from, a, from a prehistoric site against a very obvious horizon notch, for instance. Yes. That's the sort of thing yes. you get out there. I mean, and I think <coughs> the sort of work you've done is great. But for me, the problem is, how do you prove it's not a coincidence? You can't. You can't, and that's the problem, isn't it? Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you were talking about doing your work on geometry and uh, making comments on that of the stone circles. But uh, part of that is also, you briefly uh, uh, mentioned or commented on that, is the unit. So, megalithic yard. Now taking out of the equation that that is probably not real throughout the entire site, but within a site, 
um, looking and analyzing um, all the stone circles, say in the Peak District, is there uh, what's your comment on um, have they used um, a set of units, the diameter of the stone circle they were setting up and creating whole numbers within a monument, not across the one, no, no, not I know what you mean. but within? Yeah. Were they using that, or is that still? Um, I've never, that low level never been able to find evidence for that. Except, no, I haven't. There's, there's sometimes there's repetitions of there's, there's, there's the set of stone circles called four posters, and they've always got four stones. But you know that's as far as it goes. They're not the same lengths along the sides or anything like that. John, yeah. Could you comment on uh, my theory that you're, you've got a working version? with alignments, and uh, someone visits, this chief from somewhere else visits and he says, oh yes, I, I like this, I want one of these, goes back to his wise man and says, build me one of these, and the wise man says, mm -hmm. and builds him a, a, a stone circle, yeah. and someone else says, oh I want one of them as, as well, and they just, he tells his wise man, make me a stone circle, now that one, original one is one that works, astronomically. But these don't work because the wise man wasn't an astronomer, he didn't understand. And therefore you get stone circles which don't have any alignments. They're just a stone circle. Yeah. Copies as to original. It's 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 perfectly possible, but I don't know how we begin to even get a handle on that at all. Well Stonehenge just am I right in saying it does fit in the winter solstice. The horseshoe yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's more than coincidence to me anyway. But then that would answer your theory that a lot of these chiefs and that were maybe later on thinking, oh, we do what they're using that to for this and that reason and it works in this way and that way. Let's have one up in our tribe up north and you know. <laughs> As someone who comes from up north, I'm rather it went the other way around. But. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, why were they building them in the first place, in your opinion? Is ideas, yeah, there could be some structural, you know, and some people to admire and make them a power thing. Uh, but there's other, you know, if it's not astrological alignments and it's a power thing, um, then, you know, there are other people I think that discuss healing or ritual purposes or whether some of these places are, are particularly selected because of um, some kind of energy lines or whatever. Yeah. Have you any comments on any of that? I think I'm, I'm, I made some comments when we were out this morning, which I'll repeat now. But I'll preface it by saying not all sites are the same, just because something's circular and has some big stones in it doesn't mean that they're all the same thing made at the same time. And we were looking at a little stone circle that nearly fit, not quite, but nearly fit into this room. And, and that's not the same as Stonehenge. You know, a different scale. There might be similarities in belief systems. But let's just for now talk about the little ones. What you see very commonly on, on the Eastern Moors, and it's a very special place in the sense that the survival is so good, there's been so little destruction in the last 2,000 years or more, that you can see the settlements, you can see the fields, you can see the monuments, rather than just you know a stone circle in a ploughed field. Um, and what you see very clearly with the little monuments is that they're very closely associated spatially with where the fields, where the agriculture and the settlements are. You get big areas of nothing, and then where the fields are, you've also got a stone circle. Now, what that means for here, it might not apply for other stone circles elsewhere, is that every local community had one. And in terms of the monuments we can see and recognise, they had those and they had round barrows. Uh, and not, not much else, occasionally a little stone alignment or whatever. Um, so, so for me, those stone circles are, to, to use a naff analogy, you know, they're, 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 they're the parish churches of the Bronze Age. And societies throughout the world have commonly 
ceremonies to do with birth, puberty, marriage and death. And they also have ceremonies to do with the seasons. And therefore I can see that these stone circles are places to have ceremonies amongst your extended family group to do with all these things potentially. Um, most of the ceremonies that you can imagine, marriages or whatever, won't leave any archaeological trace in the ground. The exception is sometimes death and you get cremations in a pot stuck in the middle of a stone circle. But that doesn't mean that they're funerary monuments. It just means that's just part of the story. And therefore, I see these places as, as, as the marking out of a place for special events, for things that, that involve ceremony, ritual. And the astronomy, for example, is just part of the let's play, make the place a little bit more special by having that amazing backdrop of the sun coming up from there. It's not at the crux of the thing. They're not astronomical calculators or anything like that. They're places for people to do things in their own community. I was going to ask about the um, stones that the circles you said were near perfect. Mm. Um, did you say that they only occurred as a major stone you would expect some by chance <laughs> to happen elsewhere? But I just is that what you said? It's, it's, it tends to be the very big important sites, mm -hmm. but not all of them are like that. Avebury isn't, isn't, isn't particularly circular at all. To what degree of significance are you working at? I don't think I was. It was, it was just saying, hey, this looks interesting. That works and it seems to be the pattern seems to be yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Sorry, I don't, I don't find statistics come naturally to me. <laughs> Can I ask about specific locations as opposed to general, uh, general theories? Um, we took, took a guide walk across to Nine States Coast this morning, and mm -hmm. we went then searching for a supposed circle on the other side of Providence Drive, Dudford Tour, Dudford Circle. Do you have any knowledge of what may or may not pass as a circle there? Um, there's some tentative circular arrangement which we found um, from another photograph um, posted on um, TMA. Um, I suspect that the circles long perished, the original circle was meant to be there, I think, in the 19th century. But have you come across any evidence or documentary or physical in, in your time? That... No, there's nothing that I'm aware of still there today. Right. Okay. I think it's as simple as that, I'm afraid. Okay, fair double stone circle on Dartmoor as to why there's two. Did they get one wrong and rebuilt or was there a purpose for having two and is there only one like that in the country? Multiple circles are rare but it's not unique. Um, you've got the hurlers on Bodmin Moor where you've got three almost identical circles and they're very similarly designed. They are of the type of stone circle where the stones are carefully selected, carefully shaped, caref nicely, neatly built. And no, it isn't that they got it wrong. It can't possibly be. Um, but I can't give you an explanation why the one needed more than one. I haven't a clue. Could I just ask, uh, is there any archaeological evidence of uh, settlers in Dartmoor at all? Yes, there is. Um, but Stanton Moor is a, is a different place. I, I was mentioning this this morning that it's got lots of little cairns, all dug by a chap, mostly dug by a chap called Percy Heathcote, and lots of evidence for burials in these little cairns. There's two or three other places that I could point to on the Eastern Moors, smaller versions where you say that looks like a funerary cairn field, cairns with little curbs, strange little rectangular cairns, cairns with little ditches round, 
you think they're fancy. The vast majority of the cane fields on the eastern moors are probably agricultural clearance cairns. They're not funerary at all. They're, they're in, they've either got relict field boundaries associated with them, where, or even where they haven't, when, where you excavate them, and I have. Um, I've done four on Sir Williams Hill, for example. Um, they all end up being a random pile of stones with a natural boulder underneath, which was the focal point. When they were cultivating, I'm not moving that annual, I'll put all my clearance stone on that. And we did excavations on Garden's Edge between 1995 and 2000, where we excavated nearly 20 of the cairns. All bar one of them had no funerary remains in them. Um, one, which was a special cairn, which had a curb, set apart from all the others, had a pit that looked like it might have had a body in it that was long gone, because it's very acid soils. Um, but I think the point about the Garden's Edge excavations, it proves the point that not everywhere is like Stanton Moor. Because Percy Heathcote, every, every, everyone he dug in, he found lots of cremations. Everyone we dug in, bar one, had nothing at all. They're not the same. Now, coming back to Stanton... The, 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 the thing is with Stanton Moor, you've got the, the, the top part of the moor is still a moor. And then round it, especially on the western side and the northern side, and, and actually here at Birchover, you've got lower shelf land, which is where all the prehistoric people would have been farming, that's been improved. So the evidence is gone. Except at the north, if you go to where the Nine Ladies is and then go west from there, there's one part of the moor there with prehistoric field boundaries all over the place, just on the top edge of where the prehistoric farming was. But everywhere else it's been destroyed. Is there any uh, evidence to, uh, to correlate the number of the barrows, cysts, cairns, and, and the funerary findings with the population of the periods? Does it seem to add up? Was, was everybody buried in that manner, or, or was it just special people? It was the vast majority of people that must have lived and died in the Peak District or anywhere in Britain haven't ended up in barrows <laughs> or in, in these little cairns. We don't know what happened to the bulk of people. So in one sense, yes, they're special people. Now, one of the problems we have in archaeology is that, well, there's lots of problems, but there's lots of <laughs> fashions of interpretation. And, and, and archaeologists, uh, I'm sorry, I'll start ranting in a minute. Um, the academic system is such that, you know, you build your reputation by rubbishing somebody else's. And, and more often than not, we end up throwing babies out with bath waters. <laughs> but one of the problems with... with interpretation of British archaeology is we perhaps have not given enough credence to regional variation because a lot of our ideas are based on where lots of excavation have happened particularly in places like Wessex and we, we've not understood well enough, although we've gone a long way to addressing the balance what's happened in, in, in places like Wales, in places like the Peak District in places like the North and <coughs> If the, the conventional wisdom on, on, on Bronze Age barrows is that they, rather contrasted with the Neolithic, where you're talking about communal ancestors in the, in the Bronze Age, we're talking about special people, tribal leaders, tribal families and so on, in barrows, occasionally with nice fancy gold earrings or whatever. In the Peak District, it plain and simply doesn't work. If you look at the Eastern Moors, where all this survival is good, every farming community had its barrow. So how can every farming community be the tribal elite, if you see what I mean? I think they are special people, but not in those terms. What they are are special representatives. You don't bury your whole family in a barrow, but you put somebody in, and every now and again, other people get put in. Perhaps when land 
through intermarriage or whatever changes hands. Although I think for a lot of the time we're not talking about ownership of land, we're talking about what we call tenure, tenure of land. So in other words, I have rights to graze here, but other people have rights as well. It's not ownership in this is mine, keep off. Um, but what tends to happen, and interestingly being studies have been done of say 19th, 20th century gravestones, when people feel threatened, they tend to display more. When you feel comfortable and, and not under threat, you, you know, you don't make as much effort. But as soon as, or, or, or that we're talking about established elites here, or if you're nouveau riche, then you tend to be very flash, you know. Um, and it's, it's, it's that sort of thing. Every now and again, you might have had a few bad harvests. We better bung somebody else in the barrow, you know, to, 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 to appease the, the spirits and the ancestors and whatever. Um, I want, I'm going to sidetrack now, because one thing I wanted to say, well, somebody said something before. Archaeologists always get slagged off for if they don't understand the things, saying, oh, it must be ritual. Uh, I just wanted to comment on that, that actually this whole idea about practical things and religion and ritual is a very modern way of thinking because people in the past often did not make those distinctions in the sense that if you believe in the spirits of place or you believe in spirits of ancestors and you want their help having a ritual or a ceremony is not a ritual or a ceremony in one sense it's a practical act it's something that has a physical practicality to it, if you believe it does do, if you see what I'm saying. This whole idea about these boxes we put things into is perhaps not a very constructive way of, of, of looking at the past. Can you just ask you about the age range of the bodies that you found? What, on average, are there be any ages for yeah. many children? Or? Yeah, in, in, in Barrows... There's no distinctions between male and female um, in terms of the richness of grave goods or the quantities. Similarly, there's lots of children. Um, it's interesting what you were saying because I, I understand that in some uh, hot circles, um, human remains are included in the building of the walls around, um, but not from one person, but from several and some of the sites around. Uh, so mm. it, would, it would indicate that there is this synthesis between life and death. And how uh, you were saying, it's not, it's not distinct that it's all part of the way they lived. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether the, that sort of thing has happened. <coughs> whether this, I mean, when I say it, human remains, from what I understand, it's only small bone. You know, they've almost integrated them with the whole... Yes. Um, um, or on thresholds. That, that is found occasionally. With the houses I've excavated, which happen to be Bronze Age on, yeah. on Garden, I'm sorry, Iron Age on Garden's Edge. Interesting other symbolic acts as well. Um, two houses um, that we excavated had, they were purposely closed down, presumably after somebody had died and there were no longer houses. In one case, they, they built a bank of stone across the entrance, blocking the entrance. And then they got saddle querns, which are used for, for grinding corn. And it, if anything's going to be a, a symbol of life, it's a saddle quern. And they turned them upside down and put them in the entrance. Similarly, we had a big house where they closed the entrance so you could just walk in a little path like this through the entrance after the house had gone. And they put a saddle quern right in the middle in a pit upside down um, these again you know, it, all, all these things blur the distinctions between functional because you've got ritual in the functional and vice versa a couple more hi you're, you're saying about these, the current stone being upside down is there any relationship with the uh, sea henge having the uh, troop re, uh, roots sticking up in the air I don't see why not. I mean, it's not something I've given any thought to, but it's the same basic sort of thing, yeah. One more? Yeah. 
Go on. <laughs> Some years ago, I, um, I worked in uh, the very remote parts of Zambia, and I was reminded of that by going up and seeing your field patterns, because there, as I walked through the, the villages where I was working, there were round huts on level platforms, there were the fields where the crops were grown, with stones cleared to the edges, there was a cattle and a graze, and within each village there was a round circular structure, usually made of timber, because that was what the local building material was. Um, as you were describing, well, well within the, uh, the boundaries of the settlement. Um, and there were the cattle cries. And um, I was just slightly reminded of that by the stone circle up there with its internal curves. Yeah. That obviously wasn't an open circle, it was a, a closed ring. And I just wonder if you have any similar evidence of, of cattle crafts in these settlements, which I think you would probably need when you were operating a mixed economy, a mixed farm. <coughs> Where do I start? Uh, in different parts of Britain, like on Dartmoor's a classic example, you've got what are what we call pans, which are probably livestock crafts. Oh, that's one of them. We don't get anything like that in the pictures. You get them in the Yorkshire Dales as well. For some reason, we haven't got any, except for half a dozen on the highest part of Limestone Plateau, just south of Castleton. And they look like stock crowns. But on the eastern moors, there isn't a single one. And I could lay hand on heart and say the odds are there never was a single one. And I don't know why. Except I do know that so when you've got the hedged fields and so on, I don't think you really need a corral. You can just put them in the nearest field and close the gate. Um, that's all I can think. That but would you not have to keep them out of your arable? Yes, so but what... You your, your, your crops? Yes, you would. Um, but it works two ways. You want animals on the field some of the time because that's how you maintain the fertility, by them being there and manuring the fields. And so, if you've got stock-proof fences, that's one way of doing it, opening and closing gates and letting them in one place one time and then in different places another time. But the other way of doing it, which works equally well, is for continuous herding or shepherding to be taking place. Um, just as an aside, but I can't help mentioning it because you just, you just struck a thought here about corrals. The Barbrook two-stone circle, which unfortunately it fell to me to completely restore because someone had completely vandalised it, is one of these... It's got a little entrance, but a bank with, with standing stones on the inner, on the inner edge. Um, it was one of those opportune times when I thought, God, I wish I'd got my camera. And I went past early one morning, and there was a whole load of people asleep in the middle of it, all in little bell tents, all with one-man tents. There was about six tents filling most of the interior. And then I realised exactly what all the standing stones were for, because each one had a, had a pushback bent against it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just uh, thinking about what the, the gentleman had said about it being a corral, but then I thought more what if it was like the cattle market ring? where if you're going to swap, say, like tucks or bulls or any kind of livestock that needs swapping for, um, you know, obviously breeding purposes, yeah. not having the same genes and breeding all the time. But, 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 for that, if every place has I think, one... Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, it just doesn't feel right to me as an idea of that. But <laughs> one, one of the problems we have on the Eastern Moors, and, 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 and a lot of the uplands, of course, has been mentioned by several people, is the soils are so acidic, the animals don't survive, animal bones don't survive, so it's really hard to study that sort of thing. But. I need to go on about stone circles at the time, because it's like taking up a whole hour. But has there been any excavation since the stone circles in Derbyshire that indicates there was lots of charcoal burning, lots of wood burning? There's quite a few stone circles on Dartmoor which have been excavated, and the only thing found has been huge it's amounts of charcoal. charcoal. Not in the Peak District, no. I mean, there's not been a lot of 
excavations, one, two, three full excavations, and none of them have had that. Because I know what you're saying about um, alignments, because I don't particularly believe alignments at all. But what you did say is about when they were built, there's loads of trees around, so you can't really see your territory anyway. So the theory would be about <coughs> burning lots of wood inside the stone circle as um, showing someone where to go? Possibly, but I don't think we've got the evidence for that. Um, someone mentioned earlier, and I realised now, I've just thought I went off the track, they were talking about, OK, you can't get a good alignment from stone circles, but if you've got outlying stones, you can. That's the approach Professor Tom took. And in theory, it's right. But the trouble is, some of those stones actually turned out to be parts of other monuments and they weren't outliers to the stone surface. OK, I, I, we are going to have to end it there, I'm afraid. I didn't want to cut it short because it's, it's such a unique opportunity, but do find John afterwards. So I will say thank you immensely, John, for coming along. And um, thank you. Thank you.